Thank you for joining us here at Heritage this afternoon for a discussion of the Venezuela situation following their elections. We welcome those who are joining us on our Heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Would ask everyone here in-house if you'll check that cell phones have been turned off. It will be appreciated by those recording our events. And of course, we will post the program within the next day for everyone's future reference as well. Hosting our discussion today is James Roberts, Research Fellow in Freedom and Growth in our Center for Econom International Trade and Economics. His primary focus is on the production of Heritage's annual Index of Economic Freedom, but he also studies economic and political issues in Latin America and Europe, as well as a development assistance and nation-building issues. Prior to joining us, he served at the State Department for 25 years with tours of duty in the U.S. embassies in Mexico, Portugal, France, Panama, and Haiti. And he also helped coordinate several major U.S. assistance programs, including efforts to reform Eastern Europe economies and most recently reconstruction in Iraq. Please join me in welcoming Jim Roberts. Jim? Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks to everyone. Um, and uh, we, of course, our thoughts continue to be with the people in Boston today. And while we're still thinking about them and praying for that situation, we're also going to turn to the very important events that have occurred in the last few days in Venezuela with the election, the very close election that was held on Sunday. And in general, we're going to be looking at the situation of Venezuela with two of our, our experts from Heritage uh, who are joining us, I'm happy to say. Unfortunately, uh, one of our speakers, John Zemko from the Center for International Private Enterprise, was unable to be here to, due to illness. But, uh, we were very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Ray Walzer be able to join us uh, and uh, take, play, take part in the discussion. Dr. Walzer so is also a, a veteran of the Foreign Service and a senior policy analyst for Latin America at Heritage. He devotes attention to resurgence of anti-American and anti-democratic political forces in the Americas. And his assignments in the Foreign Service took him to Colombia, Costa Rica, Mexico, and Nicaragua. Uh, Ray has testified before Congress and has been a frequent appearances on television, radio, and in uh, print. And was also a visiting professor of international relations at, at West Point at one point at one at one time during his career with the government. A native of North Carolina, Ray has a, a bachelor's, master's, and doctorate in history from the University of North Carolina. Our other speaker is Sergio Daga, who is our visiting scholar for and uh, visiting um, analyst, senior analyst for Latin America here in our Center for International Trade and Economics at Heritage, where we produce our Index of Economic Freedom. Always have to plug that. Uh, Sergio is with us from his think tank in Santa Cruz, Bolivia, uh, Popoli. He is an economist. Uh, he is uh, sponsored here in the United States by, through the Atlas Core, which is a combination of think tanks, uh, the uh, Center for International Private Enterprise, and the Lynx Fellowship Program. He has been director of research at Popoli in, in uh, Bolivia and also worked on infrastructure research for a development bank in Caracas, Venezuela, where Sergio and I recently returned from a few days ago, where we were promoting our Index of Economic Freedom. Sergio has a Bachelor of, of Art in Economics from the Catholic University of Bolivia and a Master's in Economics from the University of Chile. He also trained at one of our uh, coalition partner think tanks in Santiago, Chile, Libertad de Desarrollo, and at the Atlas Economic Research Foundation in the United States. So I uh, appreciate both of you being here. I think we should probably start with Ray with a, a kind of a, <coughs> a, 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 a um, just a, a roundup of what's been happening the last a few days in Venezuela and politically leading up to where we are right now. Ray. Okay. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, thank you for the very nice, very kind uh, <clears throat> introduction. Let's let's sort of just sort of play the clock back a little bit, just sort of go through the chronology of what we we know is occurring in Venezuela. And so let's roll it back to uh, October the seventh of uh, 2013, 2012, excuse me, uh, in which Hugo Chavez, <clears throat> at that point, gravely ill, but managing <clears throat> at least uh, publicly to conceal his illness, proclaims that he is, has basically beaten cancer uh, and is fit to run uh, <clears throat> for, stand for re-election. Remember that 
in Venezuela, he had finally maneuvered the Constitution to allow for unlimited re-election. He had lost one referendum back in, uh, it's actually in 2007, in December of 2007, the only election he ever lost, but he managed to come back and, uh, and change the Constitution that allowed unlimited uh, re-election. So the Chavez machine was working. Um, I wrote a fairly extensive piece on that. The elections were, uh, were certainly not fair elections. Advantages rested with, the, uh, with Chavez. Advantages in terms of public patronage, uh, access to the media, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so the advantages fully favored Chavez, and he won by, he beat Enrique Capriles, the uh, unified opposition candidate, by about 11 points. Well, Chavez was much more ill than, than any of us anticipated. Uh, apparently, he was shuttled back to, uh, to, to Cuba for continued treatment. Finally, in December, I think it's December 8th, but I didn't jot down the date, Chavez returns uh, and really makes his final, uh, his final scene. This is really the last time, other than a couple of photographs that, are, that circulated, is the last time that you see Chavez. And he, uh, he names Nicolas Maduro, his foreign minister and his vice president, to be his heir. He says, you will vote for Nicolas. He is the man I have chosen to carry my uh, revolution forward. <clears throat> so you have this uh, naming of a successor. Chavez then returns to, um, to Havana, undergoes a fourth round of surgery for a cancer, which we as still don't know the exact nature of it, but we certainly now know it was a fatal cancer. Uh, and uh, he <clears throat> disappears from the scene. There's a lot of back and forthing. And most people theorize that this was the time when the Cubans exerted a kind of a senior role, particularly Raul Castro and others, sort of forged uh, unity within the ranks of the, the Chavez party, the big, the big backers, uh, and created the sort of smooth the way for Nicolas Maduro uh, to move forward. So the next milestone comes on January 10th, when uh, the day that Chavez was supposed to be sworn in. Uh, and instead of, obviously, instead of, he was unable, physically unable to be sworn in in any public manner, uh, the Constitution was a bit vague, but in, that, in essence, they finesse it. They say Chavez can, uh, when he's well enough, can assume the presidency, uh, and in the, in the, in the interim, uh, Nicolas Maduro will act as, uh, as the interim president. Serious sort of sets of, in the eyes of the opposition and many, uh, a violation of the, of the Constitution. Maduro, many said, should, according to the Constitution, have stepped down and let the speaker, the, the, legis the head chief of the legislative assembly, uh, step in and act as uh, interim president. So we move forward. Uh, Chavez in late February returns to uh, Caracas. If you're going to be a, a national hero, it's usually not a good idea to die in a foreign capital, uh, is, is one of my basic observations of sort of Walser's uh, political science 101. So Chavez returns, um, or his body was returned. Again, there's so much mystery that surrounds the, uh, the final days of, of Hugo Chavez, uh, to what degree uh, he was actually controlling the country, which is probably pretty minimal. Uh, but anyway, on March 5th, uh, or prior to that date, uh, they uh, announced that, that Chavez had died. And we see this great sort of outpouring of of sympathy, and I, I think it was real. It was it was a genuine, wasn't the sort of manufactured grief that apparently accompanied uh, transitions in North Korea and the like. I mean, I think there was a genuine genuine sentiment. Chavez had charisma. He had uh, delivered on on many of his so-called social promises and the like. Uh, so this triggered, obviously, within a period of 30 days, uh, elections, and um, so Nicolas Maduro steps forward. A relatively, um, I think most of you probably follow the news. I mean, he's uh, sort of a tall, he's got a nice big mustache. Somebody called it a sort of a charo mustache. He's a big sort of burly. He was, a, uh, he rose up as a, as a union organizer. He drove a bus for a while, uh, quickly attached himself as a relatively young man to the, uh, 
uh, to the uh, Chavez movement. He is associated with, but not necessarily married to, a woman named Celia Flores, who won sort of fame as being a defender for Chavez after his failed 1992 coup. Uh, and recently, last night, I was reviewing some materials and a series of pictures of the youthful Maduro showing up in his time in Cuba. Apparently, he was trained as a for months, maybe even years. We don't know exactly how much time he sort of spent uh, in Cuba. So he was clearly uh, seen as the sort of favored uh, fair-haired boy, although he's rather dark-haired, uh, uh, fair-haired boy of the, of the Castros. So he launches a campaign, wrapping himself in the uh, mantle of, uh, of Chavez, suggesting that Chavez has ascended into heaven, that Chavez has influenced the selection of a Latin pope. He goes out and says he was praying at one point, and Chavez appears as a little bird twittering in the rafters and the like. So people are sort of, I think, starting to wonder, is this, is this Chavez thing, what exactly is it? Is Maduro perhaps uh, playing with an entirely full deck? And that, that we will see in, in, in due time. But anyway, the campaign, the official campaign, began, kicks off on April the 1st. It's only a 10-day campaign. Uh, time is of the essence. They're certainly still playing on the sympathy vote. Remember, we're only about, uh, uh, we're less, just a little over 30 days out from the, uh, uh, the elections. And <clears throat> people basically say, you know, look, look at the opinion polls. It sort of starts out Maduro versus Capriles, who is, is reinstated as the, is the candidate. He's got 20-point leads in some polls and everything. So, then, then the polls start saying, well, people are moving away from it. And the final polls, I didn't, I wasn't a real poll watcher, and I predicted that Maduro would win. I thought he would, uh, uh, he would probably win by, you know, at least a five percentage point margin or more. I assumed that there would be this sort of, uh, this sort of continued hangover of the Chavez effect. Well, come April the 14th, the elections proved a considerable surprise, I think, to most who sort of watched the scene, uh, even including experienced uh, Venezuelans. And so Maduro garners 50.7% of the vote. That's roughly about 7.5 million votes. He had said, I'll get 10 million votes, and I'll, I'll administer a thrashing to the opposition that they will never recover from. You know, it, was going to be a, uh, it was going to be a clean sweep for the Chavistas. Uh, Capriles gets 49.1%, roughly 7.2 uh, million votes. The difference is 235,000 votes, which I'm not a statistician, but people, I think, somebody talk about this as well within the sort of the margin of error. And so all of a sudden, you have a very close race in a system in which people do not have a great deal of confidence, in which uh, the opposition has claimed that uh, there were uh, something like 3,200 observed irregularities uh, and the like. So the opposition calls for, it says, we're not going to necessarily concede. We would like to see uh, a, a recount. We want to, to look at, at the voting patterns we've, we've observed. We believe that uh, we should have a fair hearing. Well, this does not, at first, Maduro says, well, you know, that is not such a bad idea. But by the next day, he's singing a different tune. No, this will not happen. And basically, so yesterday afternoon, the, uh, uh, the National Electoral Tribunal, uh, which is not a, uh, a nonpartisan or above party uh, entity, uh, endorsed the electoral outcome, uh, denied that there would be any sort of official audit of voting. Uh, the one non-Chavista uh, member dissented from the decision, said there should be an audit. Uh, yesterday, the U.S. Uh, uh, stated that they felt that an audit, the U.S. government, the Obama administration, said that a, an audit was important, prudent, and a necessary step. Uh, the uh, European Union expressed doubts about, remember, there was no official electoral observation team from the OAS or any of the other sort of accredited or standard electoral observation uh, facilitators present. Uh, even Secretary General of the OAS, uh, Miguel Insulza, said that the OAS would be more than happy to help with an audit. So it's, it has built, but as I said, this is not going to happen. No official audit will take place. Now apparently, uh, again, I'm not an electoral expert, but the opposition does have 
copy sheets of the tallies that they took on the vote day so they can begin to produce and, and gather their own data. Now, this will not have necessarily an official standing, but, but could influence international thinking about the legitimacy of the election. So um, as, of, as of today, and I've just heard last night, uh, Capriles organized uh, the, the banging of the pots, the, what is it, the car? Casarolas. 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 I was having a little trouble. <laughs> Casarolas. Casarolas, you know, beating the, uh, the, the casseroles. And uh, there was a lot of pot banging last night. Uh, there, were, there were spontaneous, there were substantial demonstrations. Police were out. Um, he called for a day of protest today. Uh, and Jim just informed me, or we've heard that uh, the government has issued a three-day ban on any sort of public protest. Now, um, this means that uh, Friday, the day that Nicolas Maduro will become the next president of Venezuela, will be a day in which you're basically uh, inaugurating a president under martial law in a state of question legitimacy. Uh, in which over half, nearly half the country, and probably perhaps over half the country, is fundamentally at odds with your program. And then on top of that, I've got a whole list of other uh, major problems that I'd be happy to talk about, but I think I'll turn the uh, uh, over to talk about economic freedom and to people who were actually in Caracas last week. Mm -hmm. But I think that we have something that the Obama administration and many in the hemisphere don't want, we have a serious sort of emerging governance crisis in Venezuela uh, that could get ugly uh, before it uh, gets its pretty. Now, I, I don't think that the opposition there is in favor of any sort of violent actions. I think that they will stay for the most part within the, in the realm of sort of peaceful protest. But this is a very tense and, and difficult situation, which we, you know, given the fact that I interpret this as two factors are coming together that will create sort of a, almost a sort of a perfect storm. One is this large show of opposition. The fact that Maduro all of a sudden to his own base, which is diverse and fragmented, appears weak. So you've got a combination of external, you know, and then the international environment in which this is taking place. So you've got a series of almost perfect storm-like uh, pressures building on an unproven uh, and, and, and not necessarily competent leader. So, so stay tuned. I think we're going to hear more about what's occurring in Venezuela, uh, and uh, I think it's going to be... Uh, it, it's, it's going to be an issue with us for some time to come. And I think that Jim and Sergio, Sergio are going to point out some of those underlying factors that are also going to sort of create pressures uh, on, the, on the regime. Good. Well, thank you, Ray, very much. An <coughs> excellent summary of the situation, certainly one of, of instability, of uh, great uncertainty, and uh, an excellent uh, backdrop for us to discuss, as Ray said, the larger questions, the large economic forces at work right now in, our, in uh, Venezuela that are uh, creating this instability and contributing to it. We did a paper yesterday, Sergio and I, an, an issue brief, and if you didn't get one, please ask. We have copies. Uh, where we took a look at the situation that Nicolas uh, Maduro now inherits and takes over, if assuming he is successful in taking the oath of office and, uh, and is able to serve out um, the remaining term of Hugo Chavez, which is what the special election was for, which is almost a full term. But, uh, and so we're, we won't speculate on what might happen there, but we do want to look at the, o the overall uh, situation economically and the, the fundamentals when they are bad in Argentina. And I keep saying Argentina, but <laughs> in Venezuela. Well, that's an e I, I was also in Argentina last week, which for some reason, the linking Argentina and Venezuela in my mind is, comes naturally. But, uh, but the, Argentina has not gone quite as far down the path as, as Venezuela. So joining us now and to present our, uh, our indexed economic freedom analysis of Venezuela is Sergio Daga and his, uh, his presentation. So Sergio. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Jim. For me, it's, uh, I'm delighted to be here and share this panel with Jim and as my friend and Dr. Walser. I appreciate it very much, this invitation. And except we were in Venezuela last week, and 
before talking about Venezuela, what I want to do is to present some insights about the, the Index of Economic Freedom. And before talking about the Index, I want to um, define what the Index uh, understands about economic freedom. There are three fundamental principles of economic freedom. First, empowerment of individual, non-discrimination, and open competition. So these three fundamentals underpin every measurement and policy idea presented in the Index of Economic Freedom. The Index of Economic Freedom takes a, a broad and a comprehensive view of country performance, measuring ten, 10 separate areas that I'm going to show right now, grouped in four different pillars. So we have first pillar is about rule of law. And the, the areas that form rule of law are property rights, freedom from corruption, and you have limited government, and I'm not going to get into de detail any, any all, all of them, but what I'm going to show to you is that this is the world right now, in 2013. This is the average scores for uh, the whole countries, the 179 countries that were measured in the 2013 election uh, edition. And we, we see a war that actually has a three, or what I, mean, I will name three, character, uh, three features, three characteristics. First, the, there is a problem between institutionals, uh, I institutionals, there is a problem with the, inst uh, there is a problem with institutions in our, in, the, in, the, in the world. You see property rights, freedom from corruption, and investment freedom, that they have the lowest scores, and also financial freedom. This is a problem, and also you can see fiscal freedom and monetary freedom have the highest score. So in the world we're living, we have understand we have understood that we cannot have a high inflation and we should not uh, rise taxes. Not this is an average, taking average. And probably if we take the weighted average for all countries we will have some uh, differences between uh, Western Western Europe Western Europe and also with the United States and also in developing countries but what we can see right now is our is a world that has some problems with institutions these institutions that actually are the rule of the game where the incentives where you can uh, produce more and invest more so this is the score of the economic freedom on the index of, of the index of economic freedom from 19 years since 1995 to 2013 so the overall stagnation that we observed after 2008 has conceded with significant setbacks in countries previously regarded as leaders in economic freedom, in particular the United States, but I'm not going to get into that in more, in more detail. Um, in average, taking the arithmetic mean, in 2003 we see a world where free market institutions are in danger, as I, as I mentioned, and, um, and also we live in a world where, in average, government tend to permit individuals and business to keep and manage their income and wealth in their own benefits and use without imposing fiscal too many burdens on economic activity through taxation, That's as we saw in the, in the last slide. But briefly, let's, let me now uh, explain the correlations between the index of economic freedom and uh, economic growth, prosperity, and social progress. First of all, sorry, let me show you the, this is the, the top 10 uh, index of economic freedom world leaders. We have Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, and Switzerland, which is in the, in the top five. Uh, the least free economic freedom, or probably the most repressed economic freedom, econ economies in the world are North Korea, Zimbabwe, Cuba, and Libya. Uh, Venezuela is among them, I want to show it to you right now. And United States is, uh, ranks in the 10th place, but uh, scores of the United States lower this year in turn, in regarding, uh, <coughs> regarding last year's. Chile is the South, the South America, Central America leader. With the, it's been since like that since probably 10 years now. And I want to show you some similarities between Chile and Venezuela and also some disparities. This is the economic freedom. It's a key prosperity. You can see that it is a pretty good correlation between economic freedom and um, prosperity in terms of GDP per capita in PPP terms. Also, the more economic freedom you have, the more you, you, you grow. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a in terms of power party PPT terms also, and it doesn't matter where you belong, what country, what continent you are in, Asia, the Middle East, Europe, America, the five freest uh, freest countries uh, have have more prosperity than the than the least free countries. 
in terms of economic growth, as I mentioned, and also in, pro in poverty intensity. This is very interesting. Economic freedom tends to uh, lead you to uh, have better social indicators. Also, a stronger, a stronger rule of law boosts foreign investment and lowers, in and lowers unemployment. This is very interesting. All the countries that have more economic freedom, they tend to, to get more uh, foreign in direct investment and also have less unemployment rate. This is a pretty neat uh, correlation between poverty rights and freedom from corruption and the prosperity. And this is the Latin America, well, actually South and Central America. What we see here is that we have three, uh, three categories, three, three, uh, three different countries. First, we have the, the, free and mo the mostly free and moderately free countries. Chile, Peru, and Colombia are among them. And then we have the mostly unfree country in South America and Central America, which is Brazil. And I want to say just a few words about, about Brazil. Brazil belongs to the mostly unfree countries of the world due to the absence of an, an, an efficiently functioning legal and regulatory framework. Why do I want to say that about Brazil? Because if Brazil had some, can boost economic freedom, it can, uh, it can give more, it, it can have an, an expansion, an expansionary uh, uh, to, to other countries. That is very important with Brazil to have a more economic freedom. And a second, and lastly, I have to show. I wanted to show Ecuador, Venezuela, Bolivia, and Argentina, which are the repressed economies in South, in South America and Central America. Nineteen years of economic freedom can give you uh, what's going have, have been going on in, in, in Central and South America. And you have Chile as the as the leader. It will always be like that. And um, if you see Venezuela and Argentina, you can see a downtrend, a downward trend in, the, in, in their economic freedom score. And the reason is pretty straightforward. In 1999, Chavez takes office. Um, prior to 1999, when Hugo Chavez took office, Venezuela scored 54 in the index of economic freedom. Today, the nation scores only 36. So it's, um, a, and it's a nearly 20-point plunge is among the most severe ever recorded by a country in the history of the index. Uh, and it's 2013 rank, 17th out of 79 countries, places Venezuela among the most repressed nations in the world, along with, as I mentioned, North Korea, Cuba, and Zimbabwe. So let me, let me show you 10 areas of economic freedom for Venezuela. The first pillar is rule of law, for my property rights, and freedom from corruption. It seems very clear that this is, in the fact, the worst pillar of Venezuela among the others. Then, if we look at limited government pillar, fiscal freedom doesn't seem to be a problem in Venezuela. The top income and corporate tax rates are 34%, and other tax included a value-added tax of 12% on the lowest in the world. The overall, the overall tax burden is estimated equal to 11.3% of total domestic income. Well, the reason is, is pretty straightforward also. More than 50% of government income comes from the oil sector, and we have to remember that in Latin America, is a region where low taxes are, 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 are very common due to informal sector. And regarding government spending, budget deficits have fluctuated depending on changes in the price of oil. Government spending has risen from 40.6% of GDP, spurred in part by oil profits, and public debt has risen to over 45% of total domestic product. And the score is influenced by the explosive increase in government spending in the run-up of 2012 elections. Regarding regulatory efficiency, regulatory encouragement on private business continues to increase, with heavy government control and intervention discouraging entrepreneurship. There is little transparency in decision making, and most contracts are awarded without competition, obviously. There is no minimum capital requirement for establishing a business, but the process takes over 100 days. The labor market remains controlled by the state. Inflation continues to be extremely high, in fact, according to Mario Grady of the Wall Street Journal, and, and you will, you, you will, you will see, uh, read that in the issue brief, over the last 10 years, inflation in food and non-alcoholic beverage is 1,284%. In 1998, before uh, Chavez took power, there were more than 14,000 private industrial companies in Venezuela. In 2011, after 13 years of extensive nationalization and expropriation, only about 9,000 remain. 
Y last but not least, the open market pillar, the trade weighted average tariff is relative high at 10.6%, and extensive non-tariff barriers further distort the free flow of goods and services. Private investment remains hampered by state interference in the economy and hostility to foreign investment. Coupled with threats um, of expro expropriation persists, the financial sector is tightly controlled by the state and credit is often allocated on the basis of political expediency. This is the comparison between Chile, the top uh, leader in the region, and Venezuela. As you can see, there is a huge difference between them. Mainly property rights, freedom from corruption, and investment freedom, which are the main characteristics and the main features of the institutions. Now here, I, what, what we did, we, we divided the, the four pillars into the 10 areas, and you can see the down, downward trend in every of the, of, the, of the areas of the index. Not in the fiscal freedom, though, that you can see there is a stagnation, and also you can see a, a downward trend in the government spending. And also, it's very important to see the labor freedom, where it's very, very low because of all what uh, we have mentioned, and the uh, a more, a monetary freedom, which is very interesting because you have two digits of inflation, uh, according to officials of the Venezuelan government. And right now, in the third month of the year, you have 8% of inflation. So let's imagine what will happen at the, at the end of the year. So I'm going to stay here, and thank you very much. Thank you, Sergio, very much. Good. Well, we have uh, presented quite a bit of information for people to think about, and uh, I hope there are one or two questions at least we can talk and have a discussion about. So the floor is yours. Please, uh, if you have a question, please identify yourself. We'll see what what you want to talk about. <laughs> I, you know, we had a when we were in Venezuela when uh, when. President Maduro was having these conversations with the little bird. It was quite interesting, actually. It's uh, <clears throat> called a El, El Parajito, and this little bird would show up and, and tell him that he was speaking on behalf of El Comandante, or he was El Comandante, it was unclear to me, but uh, that the little bird was telling Maduro t that the revolution must live on, must continue. So this, I mean, this is not quite like... Uh, like like a, a Vita Peron, this is not quite as dramatic as that, but it is a, I think it's on the same along the same lines. I think <clears throat> what's interesting in terms of political analysis is the, the similarities between Chavismo and and Peronismo, which has now survived in Argentina for I guess close to 80 years. And when did Juan Peron take over in the 1940s at some point? But um, yeah. I guess more than 70 years. So. The, and it, there's sort of an iron triangle. One of the political theories that we look at is kind of an iron triangle theory where you have kind of the unions and the, the political party is one pole, and then you've got the bureaucracy and the government, and then you have kind of the cronious kind of corporatist state economic entities. And they, they kind of work together and roll over the opposition. And I think that that, that kind of a, of a vision is in terms of, under, of understanding the process here, what what could be, or certainly what the Chavistas hope will be, a long a long running uh, performance in power, and, and one of their role models has to be uh, Peronism. It's yeah. not not out and out Cuban style, you know, socialism, but it's uh, more maybe more of a hybrid. You know. Yeah, he calls it. They call it socialism of the 21st century, and and, and I, you know, the. the the thing is, and I think you look at the, you know, you've laid out the sort of the, the foundations there, and it, it you know, the, the debate here in, in the U.S. is Chavez was still seen as sort of the, is the Robin Hood. I mean, there is, we have to, to look at his capacity to, uh, to have basically tapped the oil wealth of the country and begun a redistributionist pattern. So for one thing, Chavez is, is fairly unique in the, in the hemisphere in having this this cash cow, as one of my friends at the Foreign Service used to, he had the gold-plated ATM card, and any time he wanted, he could basically stick it into the cash machine and, and throw it out. especially the entire time he was in power was a time of right. generally rising commodity prices. Right. I mean, prices. when he took power, uh, the price of oil was somewhere, I think, was something around, I think it was like $18 a 12. barrel, and it's been up at around 100 
a hundred plus now. now there's always a discount for Venezuela. Uh, there's a, apparently, yeah. In fact, I was just a, there dirty, was a good dirty crew. Yeah. There was a good piece uh, saying, for example, <coughs> that uh, that basically he realizes international oil prices on less than sixty percent of his product. Because, first of all, you've got what you obviously saw when you were in Venezuela, the six cents uh, uh, a gallon gasoline that yeah. you, as you, you can mentioned. fill up your car your, for $1 U.S. You know, so, so first that, of all, that's a, that, at the black market rate, it's like 15 cents, we were told. Yeah, so. and, and he's got infrastructure problems, apparently, because of the recent refinery fire there. They've had to start, they've been importing about 100,000 barrels of gasoline a, a day, so that's, you got to pay for Even though they expanded the employment of PETAVASA from 32,000 employees to 100,000, they don't seem to be able to... Uh, yeah. uh, um, the actual, yeah, like overall production has apparently since, according to one recent energy expert, had, had fallen from about, from since 2007, by about 300,000 uh, barrels per day. So, I mean, what he is, there's tremendous underinvestment. I made a list of, you know, Maduro to get assuming he's got a normal country that's not, uh, you know, he's got a revised monetary policy to deal with, and he's got to deal with inflation and exchange issues. He's got to deal with the public debt issue. Uh, you've touched on the lack of, 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 of economic freedom. Yes, he has a social policy, but it's a social policy that has largely been based on simply giving things away rather than creating productive mm -hmm. Employment opportunities, and there's no question that there has been an improvement in yeah, distribution right. of income, though, right. and, and we say that in our paper. But he's at, got at, at, at uh, what cost? You know, he's got yeah. to obviously address the whole energy policy issue. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got to invest in infrastructure in addition to into energy policy. I don't know how the roads were from the airport. Supposedly, yeah, uh, they had repaired the bridge, uh, uh, the yeah, famous bridge that, that was, was down. Yeah. This is one of the most important and one of the most dangerous I mean, at times roads in the country is the road from the airport, which is on the coast, up to the city, which is about three thousand feet up. Yeah. So. Uh, he's got uh, the crime and public security has become. Uh, I mean, you guys, I gather, didn't go wandering around much at night. And, no, uh, we did not. No, we did not. <laughs> or during the day, actually. Uh, the, the homicide rates are are among, makes Caracas <coughs> among one of the most five, five violent sort of places more, in the world. More dangerous than Afghanistan. Yeah. And uh, clearly, uh, corruption issues within, his, within the regime. Um, <coughs> and <coughs> then you've got the sort of whole foreign relations packet of what you do with Cuba, what you do with Iran. So, so you know, Mr. Maduro, uh, and this is one of the things that I found interesting. Many of the commenters said, why in the world would Enrique Capriles really want to take over <laughs> Uh, the executive, given all the sorts of things that, that Maduro is going to have to deal with, and he is going to have to deal with them. You know, Chavez was the leader. He was the, he was the four-star general. And now what you've got is, a, I look at, you know, he was a militarized, you, you've got, uh, you know, you've got a whole bunch of brigadier generals, you know, one-stars are all saying, I'm just as good as, mm -hmm. as he is. And, and you're going to have, a and apparently, this coalition ranges from the fat cats who profited from the crony capitalism all the way down to the, uh, the sort of the, the poor masses, to the sort of, apparently there are sort of armed militant uh, radical groups within the barrios devoted to defending the revolution. You've got the role of the military to sort of sort out. Um, so you've got this, this base that, that Chavez could wield together is 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 could potentially become unstable. That through, was that internal the force. Of his personality and his so charisma. so, you know, it really is going to be, I think, um, subject for future programs mm -hmm. at Heritage. Yes, and what, and let me just say, in addition, to the, extending that analogy in, regionally, you have you have other pretenders to the mantle of Chavez now rising, especially Rafael Correa in Ecuador. And who are challenging, going to be challenging Maduro for leadership of the Chavismo movement. I want to touch base with you, Ray, about Diosdado Cabello. Yeah. What's your thoughts about him? He's the president of the Congress there. Yeah. And there's, there seems to be a, a rivality between Diosdado Cabello and Nicolás Maduro. What, what's your thoughts well, about I've it? never had the pleasure of meeting the gentleman, and he doesn't come to Washington on the usual speaker circuit, yeah. but mm -hmm. uh, uh, the word that you read from, from those who, who follow it is that he, this is the, this is a former military officer, Diosdado Cabello, who was, um, uh, was, um, was part of the core group of, of Chavez's military buddies. 
goes back to the, to the 1992 coup. He's sort of a short, stout, sort of bullish. He's sort of very much the physically the opposite of Maduro. The, the argument is that, that Cabello is close to the military, being an ex-military officer, that he is more of a nationalist than an internationalist, that, that Maduro is kind of this internationalist wing, um, and push is going to come to shove in the, in the process is, look, if, if the wheels are coming apart, we've got to concentrate our energies on, on building a stronger sort of base here <coughs> of getting the, you know, the, the, the economic house in order so we can continue our, the, the Chavez uh, regime, but we just can't go in every sort of direction. So the, the, the impression is that obviously the, 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 the transition to the Maduro presidency uh, took place in a sort of seamless fashion. And Cabello has gone lockstep with, uh, uh, with Maduro. Uh, and so there's been no evidence of the only thing I saw yesterday, I think, in terms of the reorganization is that they've now got a new vice president. Mm -hmm. And the new vice president is, uh, is what's his name, Areza, I believe. And Areza happens to be the son-in-law the, of, of the late Chavez, married to <coughs> Chavez's daughter. So mm -hmm. actually, Hawa, uh, the foreign minister, has now been dumped. It's kind of who's vice president today, but apparently uh, yesterday sort of lost in the, in the news was the selection of Chavez's son-in-law as oh, the new vice president. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so they're sort of already talking about renewing the cadres and, you know, they're going to go like all, in tough, all tough situations, the the Chavistas are going to go to a lot of meetings now, and they're going to get into sort of group, you know, into focus groups and try to figure out where their where their message is going. But Cabello is apparently seen as 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 a person who will have uh, an influence, and as as if the figurehead president weakens, you may not remove him, but you're going to start controlling him mm -hmm. from from within, and I think that's going to be uh, sort of you know. That's where the knives come out when the doors close yeah. uh, in the in the Mira Flores Palace. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where the knives come out, and uh, mm -hmm. and we'll see, uh, you know, who comes out of the room with with all their digits intact. <laughs> well, I think we maybe we have managed to simulate a few questions. I think Anthony, you have one. Can I please? Yeah, Anthony Kim with the Heritage Foundation. So, I guess we can confidently say Venezuela is another failed state, but not completely failed state. Given the lack of economic freedom, what can we do? And what should we do in terms of helping uh, those people in Venezuela? I mean, we talked about the problems, yeah. but what kind of solutions can we possibly propose? And that's one part of the question. Mm -hmm. And in a bigger picture, uh, do you think the economic freedom, the future of economic freedom in South America is more or less doomed? Because I see Chile, Colombia, those countries, they're doing okay, but a lot of other countries, you know, Argentina, Venezuela, and Cuba, I mean, how do we remobilize the mm -hmm. big momentum mm -hmm. for moving towards greater economic freedom in South America? That's a great question. Yeah, great yeah. question. Uh, there's been kind of a parting of the ways, I mean, at, right along the Andean you know, ridge, I think you'd have to say, with Brazil being the big exception, as it always is, a special case. But, yeah, you have the, uh, the uh, Pacific Rim countries now get, coalescing into an alliance, and we were just in mm -hmm. Chile, and uh, they had just, the Chilean government officials we met with had just come back from a meeting with the, for the Pacific Alliance, that is with, uh, Chile, Peru, Colombia, and Mexico, which is all, all friends of the United States, all with <coughs> trade agreements with us, and uh, that is very promising development, I think, even though there are, you know, left of center, or historically left of center governments, especially in Mexico, the PRI is now back in power, but they are making surprisingly good moves, and from our point of view, uh, good uh, reform moves, long overdue. So, and then, you, of course, on the other side, as you mentioned, you have the, uh, the Alba-Chavista kind of coalition with uh, Argentina being kind of an aloof, mm -hmm. distant, but uh, something that maybe somewhat condescending member of it, but and not even, not a formal member of Alba, but, mm -hmm. yeah. but uh, ideological kind of soulmate to. Uh, so, yeah, and that's, it all, it's why the Index of Economic Freedom, as you know, points out so that it is so important the policies you have, the ideas, they matter, the direction that it takes a country. And that's really what we're seeing is divergence where you have Chile now. 
the only country in South America that is actually officially designated as a developed country now. It's a member of the OECD, and it has a, a, a per capita income above $10,000. And, and then the other countries that are, have this uh, tendency, this tendencia, as we said in Spanish last week, of Colombia and Peru on our index with a good positive direction and improving uh, all the indicators. So a very important point. Yeah, thank you. You have other yeah, comments? I, I just a couple a couple of points you're leaving. I think what you're seeing really is 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 kind of this. You've got the Pacific Rim side, but when you talk about uh, and and this is we in Washington all just want to see everything from the Rio Grande all as one one piece, but mm -hmm. we're seeing clearly a diversification of Latin America. We're seeing the our sort of our near at broad, which is Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central America, and, and to a degree Colombia in our sort of zone of influence and very much connected to our markets. You're seeing this emerging Pacific Rim. Uh, and then the other is, of course, the Brazil-based. I mean, first of all, you, you, Brazil has a left, has, has under, the work, under the PT, has, has a left-leaning uh, uh, government that has endorsed and basically supports the Chavista system. You have the, the union of, of Mercosur, Mercosul, uh, in which clearly Brazil is the dominant partner. Ec Brazil's economic freedom scores are, are not high. They're in the, yeah. the mid-ranges, if I remember. Be, yeah. uh, but, but they have had, uh, and I was just reading a piece today pointing out, you know, slowing growth in this, in Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela could create a kind of a, you know, these, Brazil was sort of carry, you know, was sort of high flying and now it's kind of mm -hmm. uh, not flying quite so high. So, mm -hmm. so I think Brazil will be how it goes and, and how it, remember when we had the, the gentleman from the, 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 the DCM from, from Brasilia talking about, you know, that there's, between Dilma and the, 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 the Chavez regime, there's a bit of, you know, there's, there's a bit of caution. So I think they're going to play. But how Brazil weighs in and what it has to say will be a factor, I think, in, yeah. the, in the future course. Yeah. I don't think that you're going to see, I mean, Venezuela will become, it will certainly place, replace Colombia as on the failed state index as tensions uh, mount, but it, with its oil reserves and everything like that, it's not going to become a, a, a Haiti or a, a, or a Somalia or a truly, okay. it'll become, uh, an, I mean, the, you know, the, the worst sort of thing is it becomes increasingly sort of ungovernable and has to resort back to, to you know, acts of repression, which would carry it back into the sort of the models of the 1970s and, yeah. and a, you know, almost a, a, a more authoritarian, I mean, it's, it's authoritarian, but it's sort of authoritarian light. If it had to move into a, into a basic sort of authoritarian mode, we would be going into, in the democratic 21st century, into a, into a model we're not familiar with. Of course, uh, Ch Chavez didn't listen to Dilma, to, to, who told him to go to Sao Paulo for treatment for cancer. And, uh, <laughs> that might have made a big difference. Okay, talking, so. talking about reforms that Anthony asked, we can divide them in short terms and medium long terms reforms. Right now, as uh, you uh, you said, you see these kind of failed states in, in the region. But actually, there are some reforms that they can take into account. Mm -hmm. they, they can undertake, for example, entrepreneurship reforms, business <coughs> uh, freedom. They can lower the obstacles to create enterprises, which it helps everybody. It's not a political issue. So probably they can move forward over that. Probably also they can lower government spending, not in the social issues. These not are in the Chavistic uh, states, are you saying? Uh, yeah, yeah, the Chavistas. They, they, they can lower this, this, uh, government spending, not in the social issues, not social indicators, but government uh, in current government. Yeah. The, the, the size of the public sector in Venezuela either doubled or tripled, depending mm -hmm. on who you read. Mm -hmm. and so huge, a huge number of people now work for the government, and they don't really, a lot of them don't really have jobs, yeah. except to be kind of political actors. I think so, I, I read somewhere one in every five voters was on the government rolls. Mm -hmm. as, as, uh, mm -hmm. as, so clearly patronage has been a major so tool. There are some short-term reforms, and also medium and long-term reforms are actually have to be taking, undertaken in terms of institutional reforms. It means reform the judiciary system, reform the, the trust between police and the people. It has to be you know, talking about the democratic institutions they have to work. And um, we see that these are three uh, 
two kinds of uh, reforms that can be undertaken. Short-term reforms that have nothing to do with political issues and long-term, uh, long, the medium and long-term reforms that they have to be, they have to be structural reforms in terms of post economic freedom. I mean, I cannot agree with you anymore, but playing devil's advocate, so who's going to take that task? I mean, that's the key question I guess we're facing. You know, who's going to do well, that? Enrique Capriles would like to take it, I'm <laughs> sure. You know. That's well, the, that is the, the 64,000. Well, as, as they say, necessity is oftentimes the mother of invention. And if, if worse comes to worse, they may have to, uh, you know, there are, you know, they, they've, they've gone their own way. They've gotten out. They want to get out of the global system. They brought their gold home. They've done all sorts of, of, of sorts of things, but maybe economic realities. One, one, one party who apparently we haven't mentioned who has a certain amount of influence is the Chinese. Mm -hmm. The Chinese are, have lent them somewhere between 30 and 40 billion dollars on, on sort of advanced oil sales and the like. Apparently uh, those who, who follow it claim that the Chinese are, are, are certainly reluctant to give any more money. I mean, we talk about conditionality as something Washington imposes, but I think that Beijing might have its mm -hmm. uh, its conditionalities too, and if they want access to um, uh, to further uh, Chinese capital, uh, it may force certain types of structural reforms and yeah. the like. So, it, so point. again, mm -hmm. uh, you have a leader. You know, Chavez marched around the world and 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 projected this great image, uh, and he's not there anymore. So, uh, so it's going to be again, uh, you know. I think necessity may drive them to, to make, or they really do, you know. And, and I see a big feel for think tanks here also in Latin America. We, we lack think tanks that have the good ideas in order to boost economic freedom and democracy. And, and, and a place for opposition politicians to exactly. land when they're out of office. I mean, we, of course, when we were in Caracas, we were trying to support and very much appreciated the organization by the CEDICE is the group there that is a heritage coalition partner. And, and that we need more think tanks like that in Latin America. So, so you can have an alternative when something hap big happening, like, like happening in Venezuela right now. Okay, what happens if, if Capriles won't? <laughs> what he's going to do about it? He, I, maybe he's showing a plan, an alternative, what the, all the reforms that we can make. And, and more, and generally, more civil society would civil be society. helpful. So. Well, good. Well, really appreciate uh, both of you joining us. And thank, thank you, you to our audience. And, uh, it grew over time. Thank yeah. you all for coming. Thank you. And, uh, thank you very much. Your, uh, uh, this opportunity. <laughs>